All right, well, uh, questions from last week's reading. Last two weeks, actually. I've been gone for a while. Covered a lot of territory. We're certainly glad you're back. Well, I'm glad to be back. Very glad to be back. What's that? Yes, from 7 o'clock in the morning till 9 o'clock at night. I was in classes for eight days, or seven days. Saturday and Sunday, yeah. We, we did take a, an hour out for a worship service on Sunday. And then went right back at it. So, um, <laughs> I, I did get some discussions. Yes, yeah, yeah. What I was wondering, <clears throat> when Jesus died and he was on Earth forty days, it said he only showed himself to believers and not to the public. And I was wondering why he didn't show himself to the public. Um, he had shown himself and made himself known to the public plenty of times. And, and I, I don't fully understand. There's a lot about this that I don't understand. And this is one of those things that it does make you question. My first response is that it, it's, it's because he's, he dedicated those days, the, that time, to those that he knew he could make the biggest impact. Those were the ones he had in, in many ways said, at, from this point forward, I'm putting the mission in your hands. I'm here to help you, but it's in your hands. And so he, and instead of going around and using this as what we would call an evangelistic tool, where he goes around saying, here I am, you better believe in me, he chose to instead invest in those that were going to be carrying his message forward. Does that make sense? I, I still would think that it would have been a lot better to... Well, basically, he wanted to showed the believers, you know, that he died on the cross for them. And show and maybe, them. And maybe if he would have showed to the public, maybe they would have said, well, he never died in the first place or something. I don't know. There was definitely a lot of that discussion going on. But for, for showing it to the, to the public, just getting someone saved, as we, as we see in the book of Acts, just getting someone saved is not the point. He could have shown himself and led masses to himself. But who is going to disciple them? Because he knew his time was limited and he was going back to heaven. So he wanted that work to be done by the people who would carry it through and would actually do the discipling. Um, right. And, and Jesus has already addressed the crowds numerous times I'm sick of you following me because you want your stomachs full. And they would have it again, and they would respond. I mean, when you talk about 3,000 people getting saved the first sermon Peter preaches, they will respond. But they have to respond when there's someone there to do the work of discipleship, to follow up with them. Any other questions from the last? Yes, Wayne. What, what if he made himself so public and went on the grand tour, let's say? Do you think they would re-crucify him? Would he anger them or not? Do you think they would have the fear of God then and believe him? I, I'm guessing based on their decisions, because the, the chief priests knew exactly what had happened. They just lied to cover it up. Their, their lies were, you know, he wasn't really dead, his disciples stole his body. I mean, they would have lied to cover it up. Um, but then he would have had such a massive following that were still not genuine, still not discipled. And then when he did return to heaven, um, and part of this too, the lessons that the disciples needed to learn, he taught them everything ahead of time. But you know how... Jack, when you were student teaching, I'm guessing that you, you learned everything in the classroom. You went out and you started your student teaching. And then you had all the questions. Then once you've gone through that, then you're like, oh, now I know which questions to ask. Right, there's a lot that they didn't learn in class. There's a lot of what Jesus taught them that didn't fully make sense until after the crucifixion. And then they needed the time to sit down and say, okay, now we start to see this, but explain this. We start to see this, but explain this. 
And there's a part of that. I mean, he, 40 days is not much time. And he wasn't with him all the time. It was kind of come and go. Because I believe he was appearing to others all, all around. Um, so, yeah, he's got limited time. And they need all the time that he's got left. And then he wants the mission to be in their hands. He wants them to do the work so that the disciples are made by people who are there to be there with them. I had a call from McCook last week, or a Facebook message, right before I left to go to Olivet. And a lady telling me that someone in the church that Janelle and I had worked with um, was really struggling and really needed um, one of us to contact her because she didn't trust the new pastor. They, they just got their new pastor last, uh, the 1st of July was his first Sunday. Um, and she didn't trust him yet, but she needed somebody to talk to. And my response to her was, I've called your new pastor. He's aware of the situation. And he'd be happy to sit down and talk. But this person needs someone who's going to walk with them. Janelle and I could call, make one phone call, but she needs someone that's going to walk with them. And we can't do that. Those that are there can do that. So um, it, it's the same concept. Jesus could have presented himself. Big show. I mean, if, if I were Jesus, I would have waited till now. Because then you get on CNN News and the whole world knows. Uh, he did. I, we saw him. <laughs> I, I was I chose CNN intentionally there. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, it would definitely help the passion level. I mean, you're, you're really excited, and, and, and it really does help give you the assurance. You know where you're going. And, and when you add non-believers to the mix, it does change the dynamics. Um, this is the first graduate program that I've done. Actually, it's the first schooling that I've done. My bachelor's, master's, second master's I started, and then this program, where I've had non-believers. It's not a pastor's program. It's a leadership program. And I've got city managers in there, I've got state policemen, I've got uh, nurses, I've got uh, educators, high school educator, high school college educators. It's a, a they call it a, um, no, it, it, my brain is, is fried. It, it's, it's a, yeah, I'm not going to think of it. But anyway, it's a, it's a program that involves all kinds of people. It's not just one, one program. And at one point in my in the discussion, we were talking about ethics and where does your foundation for ethics come from? You guys know where I come from on that. And I was getting pretty animated in this discussion. And But I was watching one of the guys in the cohort that's not a Christian, but he's very hungry. Um, and, and we were, the other pastor in the, in the cohort and I, the other pastors were working with him. So I could see that he was starting to, to kind of, what I was saying was getting beyond where he was at. And so I shut up. And the professor, when we went down to, to break, she said, Emmanuel, why did you shut up? And, and he was standing there. I just said, oh, I, I just felt like I'd said enough. And then in the stairwell, she asked me again, she said, why did you shut up? And I said, well, because I, I could see that what I was saying was starting to affect him. And he's not there yet. And I don't want to come across so harsh that he can't get there with me. And I did change what I said because I wanted to make sure that, that it didn't push him away so that we could still have that opening. And that definitely would have changed the environment if Jesus had tried to, to work one-on-one with, these 40, with his, his 12, the 120 that are gathered in the upper room, and then you add in all these new believers who are still trying to piece together every piece of the puzzle. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of reasons. I still think he should have stayed longer than 40 days, made it a... <laughs> but he didn't, and he chose to leave it with us, which 
still baffles me. That's going to be my number one question when I get to heaven. Why did you trust us so much? Yeah, and he had to. He had to come back for 40 days so that people would know that he definitely had risen. Um, but yeah, I think he trusts us too much. But, <laughs> but at the same time, there Yeah, I think Jesus probably played tricks on them when he was coming back for that first visit. Um, that, that sense of, uh, you know, what, what he did on the Emmaus Road of, um, oh, what are you talking about? Oh, really? What, what, what things? Who is this Jesus? What are you talking about? Uh, I, I think he was playing, playing tricks on them. Well, let's get started, because I know in Sunday school this morning, I didn't have time to finish everything that we, uh, we were trying to cover. Um, this, the next week, we're going to, and actually we started it this week, but we're going to be talking about Paul's missionary journeys. And the, these missionary journeys are, are very significant, because as we talked this morning, um, Jesus has been... Uh, has given them the commission to make disciples in all the nations. Now, they've done a decent job in Jerusalem. Through the persecution of Saul, they end up doing a decent job in Samaria and Judea. But they still have this to the ends of the earth. How are they going to get there? And, and we start to see um, that it's through this man named Saul, not only that they reached, under his persecution, they reached some, uh, Judea and Samaria, but now under his ministry, they're going to reach the known ends of the earth at that time. Um, I wonder if my battery's going down. This is... Because you had it working, right? No? Okay. All right, go ahead and... Before Paul's missionary journeys, uh, Christianity was largely confined to the areas immediately surrounding Palestine. This included Jerusalem, Samaria, Damascus, Antioch of Syria... And there was a little bitty pocket in Rome. Go ahead to the next slide. This is a map that was uh, put together um, that shows where Christianity was before Paul took off. And you'll see right over here, you've got Jerusalem. There's a nice little pocket here. There's some around Antioch. And then Rome, there's, uh, there's Christian communities. But everywhere else in the known world, there's no, Christian, no Christianity. It hasn't spread that far yet. Now, how did Christianity get to Rome? You remember? Rome is the only church that we know of that was not started by an apostle. Paul would later go to Rome. Peter would later go to Rome. But they, they didn't start the church. The church in Rome, as best as we can tell, because there's no clear documentation on it, was started by those who were in Jerusalem for the festival of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came. We see in that writing that, that it says that they could understand in whatever language they were, they were speaking in, um, they could understand what Peter was saying, and there were, must have been some who were there at that time who took this message of Christianity back to Rome. Because there's no other explanation for that in, in any of the church history writings. Um, go ahead to the next slide. A brief early life of Paul. Just go ahead and click through them and I'll catch up with them. Um, he was born in Tarsus. He was sent to study in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. Um, he, was perse- he persecuted Christians in Jerusalem on his journey to Damascus and a vision of Christ, and he was converted. He was baptized and had a ministry in Damascus. He withdrew to the desert for study, returned to Damascus, returned to Jerusalem after three years. He wasn't welcomed there. Um, Then he was persecuted, and so he returned to Tarsus. And at this time, kind of concurrently with this, while Paul is in Tarsus, the church in uh, Antioch starts to really reach out and explode. As they reach out, the church in Jerusalem, the the apostles say, hey, there's something going up there. We better send somebody who knows what's going on to make sure it doesn't get too far, doesn't get out of control. Um, By that we mean that they don't introduce heresy. Um, Let's send somebody that we know we can trust. How about Barnabas? Let's send Barnabas up there. So Barnabas goes to Antioch, and he's there, and he says, you know what, this is awesome. I know a guy who needs to be here helping me. So he goes to Tarsus, and he finds Paul and brings him back to Antioch. Um, Go ahead. Now you're locking up, huh? 
Okay, so this map kind of shows us all of Paul's journeys before he starts being a missionary. When you look in the back of your Bible and you see all of the maps of Jesus or of Paul's missionary journeys, uh, that's in, interesting. But these are all the journeys that we know that Paul took before he was uh, he started being a missionary. He was born in Tarsus. From Tarsus, first trip is to Jerusalem, then back and back. From Jerusalem, we know that he goes to Damascus. Now, this at this point, he's a pretty old man. He goes out in the desert. Then he goes back to Jerusalem, back to Tarsus, to Antioch. Actually, I skipped some. Back to Tarsus. You can see that he's very well traveled by the time that he starts traveling to be a missionary. Most people in that era did not travel nearly as much as Paul did even before he started being a missionary. And I think that's an important part of recognizing what God did through Paul is that he already had it in his mind to be a traveler. When God calls someone, typically he calls someone whose life experience match up with what he wants them to do. He's been on the road and on the sea and all over the place. And that lines up with exactly what God wants him to do. And so... As, as we start taking off on his journeys, we recognize that he's not a novice at the sea. How many of you have ever been to sea? Have you ever been on a, a cruise or on a boat or something? Um, is that something that uh, you can imagine setting off on a, a journey? And you guys probably, did you go on a cruise together? Sometimes. <laughs> um, when, you, when you go on a cruise, recognize that you're on the nicest ships on the ocean. But if you can imagine in those days, you're traveling on... The military ship is not. Yes, it's not. <laughs> All the ocean he wanted. How far did you travel on the, in the military? Far enough. Okay, and how far did, did Merle travel? I think he was on 19 days or something, day and night. Okay. He, he went from the state of California right direct to New Guinea. Okay. And, and it wasn't a good ship. It, it never came, uh, the ship that he went on never came back to show you what a poor ship was. Okay. And, and ships like this, a lot of Paul's journeys did not... <laughs> I mean, he, we know that he's shipwrecked three times at least, or four times at least, actually. Um, so he understands this. It takes a certain somebody to get on a ship, knowing what you're going to encounter. Just like Merle said, I've had enough of the ocean. It takes a certain someone to say, you know what, I know how miserable this is going to be, but I'm going to go anyway, because I've got something worth going for. Yeah, you, you get sick. Yeah, I can, I can see that. His first missionary journey, um, they, they're in, uh, in Antioch. Someone prays. They're fasting. The Lord says, set aside or dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So more fasting and prayer to determine what that work is. Laid hands on them. Sent them on their way. So first thing that they do is they go get on a boat. And we've just talked about, you know, Paul has traveled enough. That's a miserable thing, but first thing he does is he goes and gets on a boat. Their first trip is to um, Salamis. And actually, I'm going to start and tell you a little bit about Antioch before we go there. Let's go ahead to uh, the next slide, Jeff. Antioch in Syria. Um, what we're going to do is kind of give you a profile of these cities that Paul visits. So off to the side, you'll see some pictures of these cities, if there's anything left of them, um, and then some of the facts about them. Antioch on the Orient. Orontes, which is now Antakya in southeast Turkey, which is um, about 500 kilometers north of Jerusalem, was founded in uh, around 300 BC by a guy named Seleucus, um, Seleucus I Nicator. Now keep that in mind, um, who this was. It was built at the foot of Mount Silipus. It overlooked the navigable river, the Orontes, and boasted a fine seaport. While the populace of Antioch was always mixed, Josephus records that Seleucids encouraged the Jews to immigrate there in large numbers and gave them full citizenship rights. 
Now, the Seleucid Empire is before the Roman Empire, but so there, it's kind of a long-standing relationship between the Jews and, and Antioch. Um, it, it's it's going to become the third largest city in the Roman Empire. Get your arms around that. That's a big city. Third largest in the Roman Empire. Um, Paul probably arrived there around A.D. 43, which incidentally is the year that the city established its Olympic Games. I thought that was interesting in this Olympic year. Um, The population was around 300,000 people. Now, the Quad Cities is around 300,000 people. Imagine imagine 300,000 people with no plumbing. 300,000 people with no air conditioning. 300,000 people with primitive... I mean, typically you did not see cities of this size in the ancient world because you couldn't support 300,000 people. You couldn't just go to Walmart or Hy-Vee. You had to somehow find substance. Um, And around 22,000 to 65,000 of these, depending on which resource you read, was a Jewish population. So that's a pretty significant population of Jews in this city of Antioch. Now, Josephus describes this city as a huge and wealthy cosmopolitan city where the barriers of religion, race, and nationality were easily crossed and where toleration may have been a matter of civic pride. It was actually a perfect base of operation for the spread of Christianity. Apart from Jerusalem itself, no other city was so intimately connected with the beginnings of Christianity. This is a perfect city to be a launching pad for the missionary journeys. It comes back to a little bit of what we talked about this morning. If Paul would have based out of Jerusalem, first of all, there's not a seaport in Jerusalem, but if he had based out of Jerusalem, what was the general perspective of ministry to others or to Gentiles in the church in Jerusalem? Rose is shaking her head. It wasn't very good. They didn't want to reach others in Jerusalem. The Jews thought they had it. It was good enough for them, and it, they didn't want anybody else to have it. So it, it was. this is the perfect city where most people come into the church with a, a respect for one another, for, with a respect for other cultures. It was a perfect place to be a, a launching pad. Christianity arrived in Antioch after the perse- persecution of Saul. Mar- Stephen was martyred, and then the church takes off. Um, possibly one of the seven that was chosen with Stephen was a Nicholas from Antioch. Um, so possibly he came back home and brought Christianity with him. It was well established in Antioch by the time of Paul's arrival. He was called in by Barnabas to help with the growth. And I think this shows God's sense of humor. He comes to be the associate pastor of a church that's sole existence is because of his previous sinful life. The reason that Christianity spread from Jerusalem to Antioch was because of Saul's persecution. That's the reason the church is there. And guess who they call for their associate pastor? (laughs) The guy that got their church started. Um, Anyway, go ahead, Jeff. Their first city is Cyprus. Now, who is traveling with Paul or Saul? Barnabas. Barnabas. Where's Barnabas from? Barnabas is from Cyprus. He says, hey, you know what? If we're going to go out and preach the gospel, i got a group of people. I'm going to go home. We're going to have a family reunion. We're going to preach the gospel. They go back home. And actually, Barnabas is buried pretty near uh, Salamis. Um, It is on the uh, Famagusta Bay. And I'm going to butcher these names just so you know. So if you know that they're pronounced differently, you're probably right. I'm not. Um, It was founded following the famous Trojan War. And it just uh, surpassed... I don't know what I was saying there. It was one of the principal cities or the second principal city on the island of of Cyprus. It also had a very large Jewish population. And it was a city that was destroyed in the Jewish revolt of 116 to 117 AD. It was rebuilt in the 4th century. And uh, Barnabas' tomb is nearby. Uh, So this is uh, a special place for him so much so that when he died, this is where they brought him back to bury him. They moved on from there to Paphos. Paphos is a coastal city on the southwest coast of Cyprus. Uh, There's two. There's actually New Paphos and then Old Paphos. Um, But New Paphos was the capital city um, of the island. It was known for its temple of Aphrodite. Paphos apparently is where she first appeared, or the legend tells us, where she first appeared to humans. 
It's in Paphos that uh, Saul becomes known as Paul. And I think we talked about that, I don't know if it was in Sunday school or if it was in this group a couple weeks ago. Why did Paul's name change? Why do we go to Paul versus Saul? Okay, Saul was his Jewish name. Paul was his Greek name. Um, the, the Greeks or the, the Romans were, were very skeptical of the Jews anyway. Um, they weren't too prone to listen to them. Um, where did Saul's parents get his name, you think? King Saul. So it's not a very good idea to travel in a nation that has conquered your nation with a name that represents one of your kings, one of your ancient kings, your first king. So um, he transitions here to Paul, and so from here on out, it's going to be Paul. We're not going to see Saul anymore. It was here in Paphos that he shared Christ with his first Roman official, and it was here that he performed his first recorded miracle, where the uh, magician is giving him a hard time, and he just <laughs> he walks over to him and says something, and he can't see anything anymore. So it's his first miracle, uh, recorded miracle, shows up here in Paphos. Um, actually, if you wanted to sli- skip back to that slide, Jeff. Um, if you look at the, uh, the artwork here, you see how beautiful and intricate this, this I don't know, the, the floor is, the mosaic of this floor is in this. Isn't that gorgeous? And then you see the nice big amphitheater up behind it. Um, this, was a, this was a pretty wealthy city. And uh, it's, it's interesting when we travel through these cities, you, you see um, what life would have been like. When you see that kind of intricate artwork, somebody, I mean, this was a, a wealthy, wealthier area. Okay, Jeff, go ahead now. From there, they uh, got back on the boat. And if you've got your, uh, your maps in the back of your Bible, you can uh, follow along with me. Um, almost all Bibles have maps of Paul's missionary journeys. They go from Paphos up to Antioch of Pisidia. Um, Antioch, or a Pamphylia. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. First they stop in Perga. When they stop at Perga, um, it's located on a main trade route. They don't preach on their way here. Um, they will preach there on their way back, but they don't preach when they stop here. Um, it was a, a nice city, had a large shrine to the goddess Artemis. And uh, the Romans built baths uh, and a theater here with a 12,000 people capacity stadium. 12,000 people, that's huge, isn't it? Um, here in Perga, the, the reason that we mention Perga is because this is where John Mark jumped ship. John Mark gets scared or something, we don't know exactly what happened. He hightails it back to Jerusalem and uh, Paul and Barnabas go on ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Then they go to Antioch and Pisidia. Um, this was founded in 300 BC by Seleucus Nicator. You recognize that? This guy named 17 cities Antioch after his son. Same guy, he's traveling around conquering people. When he conquers them, he says, This city is going to be Antioch after my son. Um, so there's 17 of them. In, in biblical literature, we see two. We see Antioch in Syria and Antioch in, in Pisidia. Um, in 8, 188 BC, the uh, Romans freed it from the Seleucids, and it became a, a Roman city, eventually becoming the uh, uh, part of the Galatian um, area and became the capital of southern Galatia. And you can see here some of the architecture that's still there. Um, the the uh, beautiful, beautiful work that has stood quite a bit of time. Okay, go ahead, Jeff. They go from there to Iconium. Um, today it is known as Konya in Turkey. It is an agricultural center famous for its wheat fields, apricot, and plum orchards, and was ideally located as a trade route between Syria, Ephesus, and Rome. And we don't know exactly how this city formed. It wasn't named Antioch, so we don't, don't know much about it. Um, so they're in Iconium for a while. Um, go ahead. Here Paul preached in the synagogues and was originally received by both the Jews and the Gentiles. He gets there, people are pretty receptive. Then the Jews get mad at him. They incite a riot against him. So he, flee, uh, he flees to Lystra, um, and the Iconium Jews follow him and stone him there. Now, Iconium is possibly 
the hometown of Timothy, either here or Lystra. One of those two towns is where Paul links up with Timothy. Okay, go ahead. In Lystra, the ancient Antonian tribal village, they spoke their own language, even though they knew Greek as a trade language. The Romans ruled, but the town was locally gover- governed. Um, the big gods of this city, now you notice in every city I've been telling you what their god was. Because in the Roman world, every city had their own god. Every sim- I mean, they worshipped all the gods, but every city had a big temple to one god or another. And in, uh, in Lystra, their gods were Zeus and Hermes. Now, there was a, a story that was told, a legend that was told, that Zeus and Hermes would, on occasion, take human form and travel around and visit their people. And when their people didn't recognize them, very bad things would happen to them. So Paul and, and Barnabas come into Lystra. They come into town, and as they're coming into town, um, they see this man crippled, I believe. They heal him. And all of the people in the city are saying, It's Zeus and Hermes! They're here! So they get ready to offer these sacrifices. They're excited. And Paul and Barnabas are like, No! 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 We're here to tell you about the real God. The reason that they get confused is because those are their main gods. And they're thinking, We're getting a visit from our gods. Um, Not long after they're there, the Jews from Iconium showed up, and they have Paul stoned. He survives. Um, And then we look at at, uh, Lystra as a possible hometown of Timothy. Now, the last village I showed you, I showed you pictures of the city that's there today, or of the ruins. Um, They think that Lystra was up on that hill. They don't know for sure. Um, They haven't done a lot of archaeological work there. Um, go ahead. Derby. Very little is known about Derby, other than that Paul recovered from being stoned in Lystra here, so he travels on down the road a little ways. Um, it's the last church on his first missionary journey and the first church on his second missionary journey. So he ends here, and the next time he's actually going to come in by land, and he's going to start here. Um, it's the hometown of Gaius, who is going to be one of Paul's companions on his third journey. So it's a little bitty town that they think is buried underneath of this hill. And this one they're not sure of, but they think that that's buried underneath of that hill. Um, is uh, is going to be a, um, a big part of first, second, and third missionary journeys. Now, all of these cities that we've just mentioned, from um, Pamphylia, or Perga in Pamphylia, um, Antioch, uh, Iconium, Derby. Alistra, all of these cities are in the area known as Galatia. Okay? Um, what was one of Paul's letters? Galatians. What city was that letter written to? It wasn't just a city. It was written to all of these churches. Be- because when he gets back to Antioch from here, gets back into town, everybody's excited, they're hearing what God has done, But some people come in, they say they're from James, even though we don't know for sure that they were. And they start saying, well, wait a second. You can't just go out and preach the gospel to these people, have them receive it, and then they're they're good. They've got to be circumcised. And so they start this big fuss. Paul is furious. I believe he fires off the letter to the Galatians. Then hightails it to Jerusalem and says, we're going to settle this matter. But he doesn't send the letter before he goes to Jerusalem because he doesn't mention the trip to Jerusalem, and he certainly would have mentioned that if that were the case. But he gets finished with his missionary journey. He says, we've got to handle this. Sends the letter to, to Galatia, to all of these churches that he's just visited, assuring them, and, and he's pretty mean in Galatians if you read that letter. We'll read it later this year. Assuring them that they don't have to be circumcised, that they have to believe in Jesus Christ, that's enough. Yes, they have to live according to to following Jesus, but they don't have to be circumcised. Um, And he really gets mean with with these these people. So this that Jerusalem council is going to take place in between the first and second missionary journey. Because in in many ways, Paul has to make sure, okay, is is what I'm telling these people the truth? Or am I missing the point? Go to the next slide. After that gets resolved in Acts chapter 15, 
then he's going to take off again. He's going to start from Antioch. He's going to go through uh, Cilicia, which is his home area, and then uh, go through this list of cities. Um, and I don't know if we'll get through this, uh, this list of cities tonight. A couple of things about, um, about this situation. As he gets ready to take off, a conflict arises. Who's the conflict with? It's over John Mark, but who's it with? Barnabas. Uh Uh-oh. Barnabas wants to take his nephew along. Paul's saying, we took him the last time because you wanted to, and he jumped ship on us. I'm not wasting my time on him again. What's the second gospel in the New Testament? Matthew, Mark. Who was that written by? John Mark. It's interesting, Paul was dead wrong on this. Paul was dead wrong on this. Um, Because he said that John Mark was useless. But later he's going to recognize how useful John Mark is. But what happens out of this is interesting. Because rather than them both saying, well, fine, we just won't go, they say, okay, you go your way, I'm going to go my way. I'm going to go visit these churches that we started. Paul said, I'm going to go visit these churches. So instead of um, allowing this to kill the ministry, they disagreed, and I believe, that, I believe that Paul was wrong. But they then doubled their efforts. They both enlisted help, and they both went out again. And I think that's important for us to understand as Christians, because sometimes we just think, well, I can't put up with this, I'm not going to work with them anymore, I'm just, I'm just going to quit. No. What Paul did was, even though he disagreed, he didn't say, I'm going to quit. He said, I'm going to take Silas and we're going to go. Barnabas said, okay, I'm going to take so-and-so. John Mark, we're going to go. So the, the work definitely continued. Um, they head out. Go ahead to the next slide. On this second missionary journey. Um, notice here that they start out going by land. We don't know all of the specifics of when Paul was shipwrecked. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, turn with with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Exodus chapter 11. Starting in verse 23. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Um, Are they servants of Christ? I know I'm sounding like a madman. Basically, when Paul's writing this letter, he's writing this letter because people have said that if you are truly an apostle of Jesus Christ, then you won't suffer. So they're telling Paul, you can't be an apostle because you're suffering. If you were truly an apostle of Jesus Christ, he would protect you from suffering. And Paul says, I know I sound like an idiot when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. And he says it several times. I know I'm sounding like a madman. I have served him far more. I've worked harder, been put in prison more times, been whipped times without number, faced death again and again. Five times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. We don't know when Paul was shipwrecked. We don't. He doesn't. I mean, we know of one shipwreck in the book of Acts, but we don't know when the others fell. Um, Based on the fact that he starts out by land, it could have been that the last trip back to Antioch was one where he was shipwrecked. And he said, enough, I need some land for a while, and ends up taking the land. I don't know. It could have been that he just said, I'm not going to be on the same ship as Barnabas, but I want to leave at the same time. Barnabas, you take the ship, I'm going to walk. I, we don't know exactly why. But I want us to keep in mind as we go through this, when Paul was shipwrecked so many times, we don't know when those fall. It's very possible that the reason he took this route was because... He wanted some land for a while. He was tired of getting shipwrecked. But also notice what he says in here. He says, I have faced danger from rivers. I have faced danger from robbers, 
from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I face danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. I've worked long or hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty, have often gone without food, shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. This was not easy travel when Paul was was going on these journeys. I think, you know, when we think about taking a trip today, you know, this last week I took a trip to, to Kankakee to Chicago. My wife took a trip to Oskaloosa for district assembly. We took a trip, um, but it wasn't very difficult. I mean, we drove in air-conditioned vehicles. We got there within a couple of hours. We spent our time. When it was time to come home, we got back in our air-conditioned vehicles after we stayed in nice accommodations with indoor plumbing. We got back in our vehicles. We came back home, unpacked our suitcases, went to Walmart, got all the groceries we needed. You're good. Traveling in those days was very, very difficult. How many of you have uh, taken an extended walk? You've walked 25, 30 miles. Nobody's taken a 25, 30 mile walk? <laughs> Why do we need to? Um, Yeah, th- that's definitely a piece, and that's what a lot of the, the letters are going to deal with. But in this situation, I want us to look at the, just the rigors of the physical journey. How hard this would be for him to, to put this many miles on his feet. If he's going without food, my guess is he doesn't have a donkey or, or an animal to ride. He's walking this. He's hoofing it. That's a long time. And when, you're, when you look at, this, at the amount of land that he covers here um we're talking so from jerusalem to antioch is 500 kilometers and i don't have the exact measurements on the rest of these but if this much is 500 that's quite a ways isn't it that's significant um he's going to go back through some of the same um cities that they covered before he's actually going to stop off in tarsus go ahead to the next slide here um, he's going to stop off at Tarsus, which is his birthplace and home. Um, it's the capital and chief city of Cilicia in Asia Minor, uh, located on the Sidonus River, 12 miles from the Mediterranean Sea. It was built on a very fertile, play, fertile plain and close to major trade routes. This is interesting for us to keep in mind, and, and this is going to kind of show up under the surface when he gets um, elsewhere. Tarsus was a major educational city. The University of Tarsus was famous and in those days was often viewed as above Athens for your seat of learning. So on this journey, Paul's going to end up in Athens. He shows up in Athens. Everybody's looking around like, who are you? Where are you from? Expecting him to say, oh, I'm some hick from the sticks. He says, I'm from Tarsus. That gives him clout. Because Tarsus is an educational city. Now, he wasn't educated in Tarsus. He was actually educated in Jerusalem. But because he's from Tarsus, people assume that he's from Tarsus and that he went to school there, and, and so they give him a higher level of, of cloud just based on where he's from. Um, and then he's going to hit uh, the cities that we've already covered in, in Galatia. Then he starts wandering a little bit. And, and kind of, I'm going to wait on this until next week because we're, we're out of time here tonight. Um, but he starts wandering and trying to figure out exactly where he's supposed to go. Um, and I think part of this may be a direct result, and we usually see this. If we tell God no or we argue with God, um, he usually doesn't provide us the right answers right away. He makes us think about what we've done before he says, okay, now I want you to do this. He does come through for us. But this probably comes back to Paul and Barnabas weren't supposed to be separated. They were supposed to still be traveling together. Paul was stubborn wouldn't travel with John Mark, and God says, okay, I want you to take some time to wander around a little bit, and then we'll figure this out. Um, sometimes we just get so caught up and we think, well, God's going to do what it, whatever I want him to do. When God has a plan and we say no to that plan, God will still use us again. But sometimes we have to wander around in the desert for a little while so before we can. I'm guessing he thought John Mark was a traitor. He left, 
didn't want, he wouldn't stick to it. He, he doesn't have the grits to go out with us. I'm not taking him again if he didn't have the grits to stick with us. Yeah, he was quite a bit younger. Yeah, it, it definitely, it definitely, something happened. It is very possible that one of the shipwrecks was between Paphos and um, and Perga, where he, where John Mark jumped ship. We don't know. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's hard to say. Now it is interesting, and we talked about this when we looked at the Gospel of Mark. Eventually, Paul's going to come back around, and he's going to ask in his final letter when he's near death. He asked in his final letter, he asked uh, Timothy, bring John Mark with you because he is useful to me in my ministry. So it'll be redeemed, but not yet. Okay? I'm going to leave us with that this week. Um, and, and we've got a, there's going to be a lot of stuff that we'll cover. Um, we will have a, a class next week. I know we're going to be ready, getting ready for VBS, but we'll, have, we'll take time for this next Sunday night to, to finalize this journey and kind of look ahead to the next week. Uh, which will be the third and uh, and fourth missionary journeys. Those actually go quick, and he's we've already covered. By the time we cover the first two, we'll have covered most of those. So, any other questions about this before we close tonight? Bob Blowers, why don't you close us in prayer tonight? Amen. All right. Yes, she's been back. <laughs>